Hello, everybody. So uh, we're going to do uh, the Mayan today with a little bit of uh, tangents, uh, uh, looking in specifically in uh, what ancient astronomers could see in the sky. Uh, that'll be a theme. And another theme is going to be uh, agriculture and uh, how in some ways uh, the Mayans were way ahead of uh, our mono uh, uh, micro agriculture. So let's get started here. Uh, it's just gonna take me a second to share the slide and per usual, uh, get it up and running. Okay, so this is kind of where we left off last time. We were, we made it to uh, uh, Chichen Itza in the um, uh, post-classical uh, period, um, and we noted that um, the uh, observatory there was uh, built with the idea of um, following Venus. Huh, that's interesting, and the different uh, phases of, of that star. And the, the thing ab uh, about it is um, uh, Venus disappears and reappears. So that was, that was of great significance. The disappearing of a major uh, light in the night sky uh, was always concerning and was um, thought to represent something. And so that's going to be the theme of my next few slides. What did that mean to ancient astronomers when things disappeared? So uh, the Mayans put a lot of significance on the disappearance and reappearance of, of Venus. So I'm going to dwell on it in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is uh, the, the platform uh, dedicated to Venus in uh, the, the great plaza of Chichen Itza. And here are, are the writings about the, uh, the Venus, the helical rising. So um, the, the helical refers to sun, right? So the rising of uh, Venus in association uh, uh, with the sun. And uh, the Mayans put a lot of significance in that. And here's uh, some of the writing using uh, more than 700 different ideograms um, and pictures uh, to illustrate uh, the, the significance of, of Venus. And while they could observe it, the conclusions they reach from it are just absolutely fraught with superstition and negative associations. The reappearance of Venus was not always a positive thing. Uh, they would plan wars around it. And who were the people that were writing all this uh, down using the seven uh, uh, hundred um, uh, using the 700 different uh, uh, characters the, the scribes. So the, the scribes um, were um, honored. Uh, they were the people of knowledge. Uh, and obviously not everybody could master uh, that. And so we see over and over again um, the uh, a depiction of the Mayan scribes and their uh, 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 great knowledge. Um, but astronomers were even uh, more honored, and we'll see why. As we look at this, I want you to understand why Venus uh, disappears and reappears. Um, and that fascinated the astronomers so much that they followed it so closely with relationship to Earth, and they figured out that the cycles of Venus appearing and disappearing, um, uh, five of those cycles matched eight-year cycles. Um, 
and they could uh, learn to predict when Venus would appear and, and disappear. Um, and there have been other ancient societies that, that have that done that as well. And that's part of uh, uh, civilization. Being able to predict um, uh, is very powerful. So um, uh, we're here on Earth and we're uh, observing uh, the orbit of Venus and we're both rotating around the sun. So the sun's in the middle. Obviously, we're orbiting at the same time, but this is this diagram is just the relationship between Earth and Venus as we both orbit the sun. But we don't have to deal with the Earth movement. We're just looking at Venus and that they didn't know back then that the Earth was orbiting the sun. So they were just looking at the sun and Venus. And this is what they, they saw. Um, now, there are two periods where people on Earth can't see Venus. Why? Because of the glare of the sun. So as Venus orbits between Earth and the sun right in here, it's there, but we can't see it because of the glare of the sun uh, overhead. Similarly, there's a second time when we can't see Venus. As it goes around in its orbit and it gets to the far side of its orbit behind the sun, it's the same problem. It's the glare problem. And we can't see Venus for a while because of the glare uh, of, of the sun. So let's see how things uh, progress as Venus is going. And just bear in mind, the Earth is rotating counterclockwise, counterclockwise. Um, so um, as the Earth orbits counterclockwise, looking out this way, it's night. It keeps going this way. And then it, the sun appears to rise. The sun appears to uh, come up as we reach here and can peek around off the edge of the Earth and see, see the sun rise as darkness recedes. Well, the same with, with Venus. If Venus is, is out here, um, uh, we're going to see uh, Venus, but we can't see Venus uh, <laughs> between here and here um, because of the glare of the sun. But here we start to see um, Venus at number two as Venus progresses in this direction from one uh, to two. So that is the heliacal rising of Venus the appearance in the morning with the sunrise associated then and then Venus becomes um, the uh, Venus becomes the uh, rising uh, uh, morning star. Hello, Shigeko. Welcome. Um, Thank you. Can uh, so, I ask you a question? On, on, uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. If, if um, they're looking at it and they're seeing Venus and they can't see Venus when it's in the front and back of the sun, then why, this is way before Galileo, why didn't they come up with the, we're going around the sun instead of the sun is going around the earth? Well, we, they might have. Uh, we know that the, uh, the Greeks came up with the heliocentric um, uh, theory. I couldn't find anything mentioning that with the Mayans, but they might have. There might have been a Mayan astronomer that said, wait a minute, <laughs> the only way this makes sense is, is this model. Um, <clears throat> and I forget the name of the Greek uh, astronomer that um, uh, uh, proffered the, the heliocentric uh, theory, but the Greeks did. So good question. So then uh, Venus in its progress gets out here and now it's out of the glare of the sun and we can see it as the morning star and it gets, uh, it reaches uh, a maximum excursion when it's out here. We're seeing Venus as the morning star way over here. Um, 
uh, and that's the maximum. And then, oh, wait a minute, now it starts inching, inching uh, back in the morning as the morning star. Now uh, we get to Venus going back into the glare of the sun, but this time on the far side. So now they uh, talk of uh, the heliacal setting. So we, we lose uh, Venus, um, uh, the, the first of uh, uh, two times. Um, and it continues to be lost to us until it reaches this part of its uh, destination. And now we get another helical rising. So just go 180 de degrees across. This is the first helical rising. This is the second helical rising. And uh, this happens every 290 Earth days. The, remember the, the orbit of uh, Venus around the sun is 500 uh, plus days. So um, uh, now you get two helical um, arisings and each are fraught um, with uh, um, uh, implications. But this one is not on the morning side. As it comes out here, remember the earth is rotating. So now we're talking about the evening star. So this is why Venus is sometimes seen in the evening in close association uh, uh, with, with the sun. So now it's the evening star. We're sitting here on earth looking at the sun. It's day, it's day. We rotate, we rotate. Then we start rotating away from the, the sun at night. Um, and oh, look, there's, there's Venus. We can see Venus out, out here as the uh, evening star and it's associated with the setting sun and drifting further and further out until it progresses to this part of, of the orbit. And we go through the same thing all over again as Venus comes back into the uh, zone of the, the glare of, of the sun. We have the second heliacal setting, which is 180 degrees across from the first he, uh, heliacal setting. So I think this is interesting. I wanted to understand uh, why Venus uh, disappears. Uh, I've taken the uh, extra time. Uh, and I've, uh, Juan Jose and I have uh, encountered this uh, phenomenon of disappearing um, uh, celestial uh, bodies before. Um, and uh, this is just, uh, uh, a um, photo of a recreation of a heliacal setting in uh, 771. Um, and this is a uh, Mayan temple. And they show uh, how the temple was lined up with the, the, the heliacal uh, setting. So this influenced um, uh, things. Um, so uh, a 584-day Venus uh, cycle, they figured it out and couldn't pr predict it within an error of just two hours. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So in a way, it's a cosmic clock. Um, the, it, it, but the associations, the cultural associations they, they made were not always uh, pleasant. Uh, so the heliacal rising was often associated with uh, destruction and was thought to be a good time to uh, start a war. Oh, fine. Uh, a heliacal rising, all of a sudden we can see Venus again. Let's, let's go fight a war. The same over here. So those were times of, uh, that were fraught. But Paradoxically, the morning star rising was also as associated with the rebirth of the Mayan hero twins. Um, and I say rebirth because uh, one of them uh, had been decapitated. I'll talk about that in just a, a second. 
So this is uh, uh, a combination of acute observation and detailed uh, uh, record keeping with superstitious interpretation. Um, it, it's a combination that uh, I, I don't think much about, but here it is. Um, the uh, Egyptians uh, also had something similar to the disappearance of Sirius uh, but that wasn't because of the blinding of the sun. Let me show you what that was. Um, the reemergence of Sirius was a very important event because coincidentally, it predicted the flooding of the Nile. And that was very useful information. So Sirius was a cosmic clock for the Egyptian uh, priests and astronomers that uh, gave them great power. Um, ordinary calendars, if they were just off by a day or two, if it was 364, you know, eventually the, that calendar is off over, over the years and it's not good predicting. But the reappearance of uh, Sirius lines up perfectly well with the climac, uh, uh, climate events on, on Earth that are not attached to any calendar, but more to natural forces. Um, and they kept track of the reappearance of, of Sirius. Um, uh, you can see it down here as the largest star. Um, and uh, where is uh, Sirius? Uh, it's uh, right here in uh, Canis uh, Major um, when it's uh, so when it start. Sorry, thank you. When it's still uh, available, uh, I'm sorry. It is major. This is Sirius over here. The bright, the brighter star. My bad. Um, it, it, it's the neck of the dog, and I'll show you another picture of that later. So why does Sirius disappear? Sirius disappears for another reason that has to do with the tilt of the earth. So this is in winter time when the earth is tilted maximally uh, away. And here it is in summertime when the uh, earth is tilted uh, uh, maximally towards uh, the sun. We're talking about the Northern hemisphere now. Everything's opposite for the, the, uh, the southern uh, hemisphere. So what, is, what does that mean? And how would that be interpreted? Um, well, you can imagine in the winter when the earth is tilted this way, you get, you're going to get a very different view of the universe heading out to the left than you are of the universe uh, heading out to the right when the Earth is tilted the most this way. And Sirius is kind of perched on the uh, horizon, as you could see in that last picture. It's pretty close to the horizon. So as the Earth uh, tilts up, you reach May. Um, and this is the June uh, summer solstice, uh, June 21st you reach May, the Earth is tilting up and up, and Sirius is lower and, and lower and lower on the horizon, and it disappears uh, somewhere around the middle of May. Um, and then the Earth gets past its maximal inclination to the sun and moves over this way, and gradually as the tilt is, is reduced the other way, and now Sirius can reappear because our platform has directed itself more downward to the direction of where Sirius is. And this reappearance of Sirius was when the, the Nile uh, flooded. They had a special temple uh, set up with line of sight uh, directed for this day somewhere in August. Um, where Sirius uh, would would reappear, um, and they'd watch the the the, the um, uh, morning sky, watch the morning sky, 
and then uh, boom, there would uh, Sirius would reappear. Sirius isn't reappearing. Our platform is shifting so we can see Sirius as the, the, the inclination of the Earth starts to reverse itself uh, from looking down to the sun to looking up from the sun and the converse looking out the other way. Um, so what are the dog days of summer? Canis Major is uh, uh, where Sirius is. And when uh, Sirius reappears, um, so does the whole constellation of Canis Major. Because Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, is right on the neck of the dog. Um, and that's what dog days of summer uh, uh, means. Um, the uh, Egyptians also appreciated other things. I'll just throw this in quickly, the Big Dipper uh, and the uh, 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 outline of the Big Dipper appears in Egyptian uh, art uh, and, and uh, mythology. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the Big Dipper uh, for the Pharaoh being associated with that, um, the Big Dipper uh, waxes and wanes and changes position. And they believed, of course, that if, when the Pharaoh dies, uh, just like the Big Dipper has cycles, that he would be reborn and, and bring all of his subjects uh, with him. So it's our uh, preoccupation uh, with death uh, that, that plays uh, a big role. And so the, the, the uh, Pharaoh was uh, uh, managed uh, very appropriately. And this little tool could be the Big Dipper. Um, all right. Um, well, how about uh, us? Why do we celebrate Christmas four days after the winter solstice? Is that a coincidence? Well, Christmas may have been associated and, and evolved from uh, the, the Roman Saturnalia, um, which was a pagan celebration of uh, days getting longer. You can imagine before people understood uh, what was happening in the cycles uh, in the sky, that as the sun started dipping and dipping and dipping, that what was going to keep the sun from just keep on dipping forever and we lose our source of heat and energy. Uh, so when the, the uh, uh, angle of the uh, earth uh, starts to change, um, as we talked about with Sirius, this time in the winter and starts tilting back upward um, so we can notice that the uh, sun is, is rising on the horizon and is not going to keep on falling in the horizon like we've been watching it do for six months. That's a time to party. And that's what this uh, pagan uh, Saturnalia was, was about. The fact that uh, Rome became a Christian uh, a country and Jesus's birthday is celebrated on, uh, uh, and coincides with the previous celebration of the Saturnalia, uh, I think is not a coincidence. Uh, it's uh, our celebration of the return of the, the sun, the lengthening of the day after it reaches um, the, the winter solstice. Um, and so here, uh, it's, the, it, it's the opposite thing that we were looking at with Saturn on, on this side. Uh, it starts moving out here, and now the sun is higher in the sky. Um, I, uh, I want to give credit for this uh, wonderful drawing that has helped me think about what's going on. Um, uh, it's uh, 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 the uh, H. Ray, the author of Curious George. He wrote a wonderful book on uh, astronomy, uh, well illustrated and uh, well th thought out. Um, and I'm very interested in uh, a graphic 
um, uh, uh, display of, of data and, and concepts. And so uh, Curious George carries the day. All right, so now back to, to the Mayan. Uh, they had 18 months, uh, 20 days in each month. And then they had uh, uh, the five days uh, to add up to 365. And those, those weren't a time to celebrate like they were in other uh, cultures. Those were considered unlucky days that bad things uh, would happen. And it called for sacrifice. So very dark, very, very gloomy. And um, this kind of is a part of my disappointment with what I've, I've found. Uh, uh, I'm not finding uh, the hopeful and uh, uh, wisdom of the Native Americans that we attributed to the Navajos and the Hopis. I'm finding something uh, darker. Uh, so five unlucky days. Um, now, they had 52 years uh, uh, in a cycle called the calendar uh, round. And how did they come up with uh, 52 uh, uh, years? Well, this is uh, the 365 uh, day cycle, but they associated uh, it with uh, two other spindles. Uh, which would come out with different uh, versions of, say, July 29th today. So uh, you could say July 29th, but it's associated with this, which is associated with this. So wheels within, uh, not not within, well, wheels within wheels here, but each of them generating different versions of July uh, 29th. So they came up with 52 versions, uh, uh, combinations of these settings uh, for July uh, 20, 29th. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and that's uh, 18,980 days. Why did, why that number? I'm wondering if that's associated with life expectancy. Uh, once you get past the dangers of the first few years of life, and once somebody reaches the age of uh, uh, 12, uh, their life expectancy uh, is, is, is much better. Um, and I'm wondering if 52 years was uh, what a mature adult could expect uh, uh, to live. Um, well, that's, uh, and, uh, this is a more detailed explanation of the 52-year cycle. You'll remember uh, it, uh, one of these 52-year cycles coincided with an, yet another grander wheel, uh, which was, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, 2,000 years uh, that uh, many, uh, 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 and that was going to culminate in 2012 and many interpret uh, that the Mayan calendar was pre predicting the end of the universe. And some new age people uh, were seriously uh, concerned that the Mayan calendar had predicted the, uh, uh, the end times in 2012. Um, so, but I'm gonna ask you what other culture has a, a similar idea of having, let's say 12, versions of July 29th. Chinese. Yeah, very good. Here, here you are, the, the Chinese uh, zodiac. Um, and actually the Taoists uh, in China said, okay, we've got these 12 versions of July 29th in these different years. Um, uh, let's, let's expand it to 60. So maybe in China, the life expectancy was, was 60 and you want each day uh, to be uh, unique over 60. So they added the five elements into this. Uh, so now you've got five elements times 12 animals and you've got 60 versions of 
uh, July uh, uh, 29th. Um, so, uh, and, and interestingly, I just reading uh, the Tet Offensive was Tet was a, a unique uh, day. Uh, uh, Tet apparently didn't come every year. Apparently, it came at, uh, every 12 years or maybe even every 60 years. I didn't have a chance to run that uh, down. And of course, the, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, pay gears to the uh, era of a ruler's reign, um, uh, which I've always uh, uh, found uh, kind of enchanting um, uh, to fix the, the calendar and associate it with uh, the history of the times. Uh, here's another thing I like about the Chinese way of looking at the seasons. Um, the summer solstice, I don't know when, uh, it's very confusing to me when summer uh, begins uh, and ends. Obviously, uh, something is ending right about now, and that is um, the, the uh, uh, one quarter of our calendar that is uh, uh, most directly facing the sun. So the summer solstice in June 21st is as uh, tilted as we're going to get towards the sun, uh, the sun. So it's always made sense to me to say, well, uh, let, let's, instead of following the seasons based on the solstice and the equinox, um, let, let's base it on uh, these other four um, uh, midpoints between uh, the, the summer solstice and the, and the equinox when, when the tilting of the earth is, is neutral, as neutral as it's going to get, which is the same tilt as um, uh, the um, September equinox. So this makes uh, much more sense. Summer began in uh, May 5th, um, and, and, and uh, autumn's going to begin next week, um, and so on. Um, one more thing on uh, uh, the ancients' observation of the sky. This uh, uh, blew my mind on a trip that we made uh, to Chaco Canyon. I think it was sometime in the in the uh, 80s. Um, and here you look at this butte and you say, well, uh, you know, Chaco Canyon was uh, was a very complex civilization. The buildings at Chaco Canyon uh, had more rooms uh, than uh, uh, any building until. Uh, a, a, a huge apartment was a, a built in uh, Spanish Harlem. Until that point, uh, the, the, the uh, apartments at uh, Taos had more, more rooms, quite remarkable. And why it disappeared is a, a, a mystery. But out in the middle of New Mexican uh, desert, you had a thriving civilization. Um, and can this, I just ask you a question? Yeah. Um, the, go back to that Tejada Butte. Um, was that Butte used for anything? Because it, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me very much of the top of the, um, the observatory in uh, Chichen Itza. Huh. No, it wasn't. I think that's just a coincidence. Uh -huh. But what, what was useful is this. Uh, uh, scientist uh, was exploring around the butte uh, and huh she saw these three slates uh, these three slivers of rock that looked purposefully leaning and she went up to it said yeah this looks like these rocks could have been place there purposefully. Let's see what's behind there. And there was a spiral, a spiral, and a spiral with 19 lines across. That's interesting, a spiral with 19 lines. And who knows how long it took the uh, astronomers at Chaco Canyon to tumble uh, to the uh, idea 
uh, and the observation that the moon is on a 19 year cycle. Huh. Well, the spiral was also drawn uh, to catch um, the, the uh, solstices. Uh, and so you could see how the solstices uh, uh, could, could line up. Um, and uh, this is uh, the solstice and the equinox and where they fell. Uh, but also these lines uh, captured um, the, the moon's 19 year cycle. Um, and the full moon at night shining through those slits uh, would bisect um, the, the, the spiral at different places and then start repeating its uh, 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 falling on the spiral after 19 uh, years. Um, and that's called the metonic cycle. Um, it's the phases of the moon recur at the same time uh, of the year after uh, 19 years. The uh, Babylonians noticed that a long time ago, the sixth century BC. Um, the Greeks and the Hebrew calendars uh, used it. It's still used to uh, compute uh, when Easter's going to uh, fall each year. Um, and what what is that? So it's um, the both the uh, the moon and the Earth. From the standpoint of ancient observers, it looks like the moon and the Earth uh, and the sun are moving around the Earth. Of course, that's not true. Um, but from the standpoint of observation. When will the moon and sun line up like this at the exact same place, each moving in a different orbit and different speeds? And the answer to that question is 19 years or 18.6 to be uh, uh, precise. So I just find this kind of stuff uh, fascinating. Um, and I hope you do too. So back to, to Chichen Itza, uh, uh, it was the uh, dominant uh, civilization in uh, the uh, post-classical. Um, remember things kind of fell apart uh, uh, for the Mayans in the lowlands around the uh, uh, 1000 CE. Um, but Chichen Itza took up the slack and came out, out, up with a new, a new culture. Um, and this was one of the first glimpses of uh, the temple in 1892. Uh, and here it is uh, fixed up uh, today, um, the pyramid of uh, Kukulkan. And Kukulkan is the feathered, their version of the feathered serpent, a recurring uh, motif in Mayan uh, society. Uh, which was handed down from Olmec society, uh, cave painting in an Olmec uh, cave. Uh, and we see it in uh, 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 this relief, a Mayan uh, relief. Um, and uh, we, we see it on uh, 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 ball game fields. So here is the serpent and he's got the patron god of the Kiche uh, people in his mouth. Um, and uh, Kiche was both the sun and rain god. My speculation is that he, uh, uh, the serpent, is escorting the sun at night back across uh, at night to the other side of the world where it can rise, uh, the sun can rise the next morning. We saw that in Egypt. There was, uh, the Egyptians had great concern that uh, the, uh, the sun disappearing at night might not come back the next morning. And so uh, the goddess Mut was involved in escorting uh, the sun during the night back around to the uh, other side. 
Um, if you imagine the earth as being uh, uh, flat and uh, uh, things going on at night uh, to uh, uh, make it so the next day will be the same. Um, so um, the pyramid also was lined up with the equinox uh, to uh, cast a serpent uh, shadow. Uh, uh, all the way up, and here is uh, uh, the, the serpent here at the bottom. Um, and here it is in a night show that uh, uh, the, the good folks at Chichen Itza put on. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the serpent at the, the bottom of the, the step. So again, the feathered uh, serpent. So uh, the Pantheon, I kind of was expecting a little bit more. I could never get a consistent fix on the Mayan uh, uh, folk stories. And that's because uh, Mayan culture was a hodgepodge of city states. There was never any huge coherent uh, Mayan empire that organized and put together all, all the traditions. But there was, again, with these Kiche people in the highlands, uh, in 1550, before the Spaniards had a chance to get to the high, highlands, uh, they uh, sat down and in Mayan language, wrote, wrote out what the Kiche people um, uh, believed. So we, we do have uh, uh, this, but it's, it's be only because the Kiche people did it. And who knows whether uh, they were representative of what all Mayans uh, uh, believed. But they were uh, at, at some distance in the highlands from the Spaniards. It took the Spaniards more time uh, to get to them. Um, there, uh, remember the highlands uh, of Guatemala are down here, and this is where the Quiche uh, population was. And their sacred text was called the Popol View. Uh, and that's where um, I, I get uh, uh, most of my understanding. It's the only coherent um, uh, resource uh, that there is. Uh, and of course, uh, the Kiche consider it uh, a, a sacred a text. It's their Bible that was written in, in 1550 uh, and uh, studied and the focus of um, ethnic pride and political movements and protest. Um, and I, I just wanted to throw in a little bit of the flavor of market day in the Kiche uh, town in the highlands of uh, Guatemala. Now, one of uh, 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 their uh, honored gods are the hero uh, twins. And these hero twins play um, a ball game against uh, the death gods and they win. But because they win, the death gods are so envious uh, that one of them has to be uh, decapitated. As a, as a sacrifice. So this is where that crazy notion that uh, uh, at, uh, when we look at uh, the uh, Chichen Itza ruins and we hear this story that the winner of a ball game uh, has to be sacrificed, it comes from this myth of the hero twins who defeat um, the death gods but uh, have to uh, pay a price for their victory uh, to the uh, envious uh, death gods. Um, the black spots, by the way, uh, signify uh, probably the spirit of the jaguar, the spots of a, of, of a jaguar on one of them. They are twins, but they're uh, uh, slightly different in, in mythology. Um, Here's something interesting. We see the hero twins uh, in Mississippi culture. We're going to get there uh, as soon as we get to the Toltecs who had communication across the Gulf with the Mississippi River. Um, and we're going to get there. Um, but a little uh, preview 
Um, here's uh, the, the Hero Twins uh, in Oklahoma, not far uh, from the Mississippi. Uh, and, and here's a, another illustration. Uh, obviously, uh, these are uh, uh, drawn uh, in, uh, by a modern artist to duplicate so you can see uh, better uh, the, uh, what, what the theme was uh, from the aging. And we, we have to uh, assume uh, that they, they are accurate. Ike and I learned that at, at, at Gnosis, uh, the extrapolation wasn't always uh, accurate. Um, and here is uh, an actual uh, shell that uh, was a uh, drawing of the hero twins that was preserved. So the hero twins were uh, are kind of by, uh, and here's the raccoon. Here, uh, the hero twins were kind of a universal of um, at least Meso and North American um, uh, culture. Um, the, I, I want to just briefly show you something just because the detail uh, is just dazzling and I, it's confusing. Uh, but these are uh, the number of days in a month, and each day is associated um, with a concept, uh, quite often a, uh, an animal, um, uh, uh, just like the Chinese uh, zodiac. Um, and there's a patron uh, god associated with, uh, with each of these uh, emblems. And I just wanted to go through and show you real quick um, the, the detail, uh, I don't understand it. Uh, uh, it, it it's incoherent. I, I can't find a coherent story of these gods like you can with the, the Greek myths. Um, but uh, I do know that uh, you read these from right to left. So this, the first one is Ico's favorite animal, a caiman. Um, and then you, you proceed to wind and then to house and then uh, to lizard. Uh, but I, I'm not going to take time to do it because it's not a, a coherent uh, a story. I just want to dazzle you as I was dazzled uh, looking at these uh, uh, things, these reproductions of what, what is in the, the, uh, the codex. The codex are um, uh, actual uh, uh, Mayan uh, writings that, that survived the Spanish invasion. Many were burned. Um, so uh, the Mayan uh, uh, achievement of uh, writing, um, uh, by far the most sophisticated of any of the uh, New World uh, civilizations, uh, what, that was lost, they, uh, just uh, just destroyed, almost equivalent uh, to the burning of the library at Alexandria. Uh, so we would we would understand more if those um, uh, codices had been had been saved. Uh, they were done. I think the question came up last week. What were they written on? Um, it was uh, animal skin, uh, mostly. Um, uh, so that's the answer to that question. And then uh, moving on from the days of the week to the nine lords of the light uh, of the night, this also was uh, uh, dazzling. Um, and just to get back uh, to the, the myth of um, uh, the, the winner of a ball game having to die. Uh, this is at Chichen Itza, the skull platform, uh, which is associated uh, with that strange uh, practice. Um, here is a, a mask uh, corner. I was uh, interested that this uh, looks a little bit like uh, the Big Dipper, as we saw. Uh, with the uh, uh, Egyptian use, just a speculation on, on my part. This is at Chichen Itza. Uh, this is the Temple of the Warriors uh, at Chichen Itza. We have some pictures of our boys uh, here. Uh, and uh, 
this is a bench, a Jaguar bench. Um, this is uh, the uh, lower uh, tariff, uh, uh, the uh, 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 temple of the, the warriors. Um, and now here is the cenote sagrada. I'm going to talk about this in just a second. They made uh, sacrifices to the rain god, uh, the Mayan uh, rain god. Um, uh, this is Ushmal, a little bit uh, more uh, to the east from Chichen Itza. Uh, we also visited that and uh, held our breath while our boys uh, insisted on climbing uh, uh, these uh, steps over here. Um, and uh, uh, the last Mayan uh, site was uh, abandoned in 1448, um, uh, voluntarily abandoned. Um, I'll show you later on the last one that was conquered. Um, but this was uh, Mayapan. Um, and the question came up last week, why would it have been the last? Because it was in the center, and it took a long uh, of the peninsula. It took a long time uh, for uh, the Spanish uh, uh, to penetrate uh, that. Um, and uh, there was also internal conflict. It may not have the the Sp uh, Spanish might have uh, performed the coup, coup de gras, but there was warfare and disease and. And a natural disaster that had, had weakened, and of course the the, the disease probably uh, preceded the 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 actual arrival of the Spanish, the uh, uh, pathogens that they bought and, and distributed, and where they landed, probably traveled through the uh, Native American population who continued to trade with each other, and um, this is actually the very last Mayan holdout that was forcibly uh, uh, taken. It was on, on this uh, island in uh, Guatemala, and it was 1697. So they, they hung on for quite a while. And this is where, where it is. It's, it's, it's in the lowlands of Guatemala uh, on, on this lake. Um, so um, I think, um, this is a good place to stop. Um, my next theme is going to be corn. And I have quite a bit to say about uh, Mayan agriculture. Um, for my audience today, a little spoiler alert. Um, the corn uh, uh, has lived on. Uh, it has found a friend in human beings who has saved corn from deadly mutations and cultivated it. Um, and uh, the Michael Pollan book, uh, Omnivore Dilemma, if you want a nice preview of what I'm going to have to say uh, next week about corn uh, and the history of corn, um, uh, read the, uh, that chapter. Uh, there's, there's a lot in there about uh, the three sisters, which include, uh, besides corn, squash, and beans. Uh, and uh, well, uh, that's my, my preview uh, for next week. Arguably, uh, uh, corn is a unique um, uh, plant, and I'll explain that next week, unique, uh, uh, very ecological, able uh, to benefit whoever can figure out how to, how to grow it. And uh, corn needed that because if they had been left to their own devices with their uh, mutations, they would have died out. Uh, so uh, it's a unique story and arguably corn is the lasting um, uh, legacy from the, the Mayans. Um, and there, 
using uh, uh, isotopes of corn. Um, uh, we now know that 50% of the carbon in American bodies is uh, from corn. Um, not, obviously not corn that we eat, but corn products that gets into our, our soft drinks, uh, 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 other sweeteners, 50%, and obviously leading to a part of the story on uh, obesity. Uh, and that's all uh, uh, for uh, the preview for next week. Um, uh, any any relevant questions before I stop taping? Okay, I'll uh, stop taping. <laughs>